je crois que je crois que c'est un registre. Oui. Parfait. Donc, uh, so yeah, um, uh, thanks a lot, Fatou, and thanks a lot uh, to Fenemel for having organized this. Uh, special thanks also to Reya for uh, for uh, leading the organization on this, uh, to Fatou. So um, yeah, I had the privilege of being an intern at Decathlon for a couple of months, and uh, I'll try to present um, uh, as much as I learned during this uh, during this uh, internship. And this was a research uh, supported by Fenemel and by Mitax also. So thanks to them. And uh, also a uh, special thanks to all of you that are registered and, and that are here now to, uh, to listen to, to me. Hopefully um, you'll learn a few things during the, this presentation. And as Fatou said, uh, it will be recorded. So do not worry if you uh, miss a part or anything, you, you should be able to, uh, to rewatch it if, if, if you like. So the presentation will go as follows. It should be around 40 minutes and we'll uh, leave some space for a question and answer at the end. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly present the, the context. So what are recommendations? Uh, why recommendations? Um, in which uh, type we, in which location should we do recommendation? Um, the usage and a bit about the data at Decathlon and the previous models that were used by Decathlon. And then we'll move on to uh, the main part of the, the, the talk. So about graph neural networks, um, why they are useful, how they can be used, um, and uh, all about uh, the information propagation. I'll move on then uh, to contribution of this research. So this research was uh, used graph neural networks, but was uh, precisely used for a couple of things that were uh, that, that were put forward by this research. So mainly seasonality and um, different kind of usage of graph neural networks. Just as a little reminder, if, if possible, it would be to be uh, unmute uh, for everyone. Um, and then we'll finish uh, with some results and uh, some takeaways. But I wanted to start off with a little question uh, for the audience. So for all of you. Um, and I was just curious, what is uh, your main domain of work, uh, research or study? Just for me to know a bit um, about the people that are uh, listening to this, uh, to this presentation. So um, main domain of work or research or study, uh, a couple of examples there about marketing, business intelligence and all that. So you can just rightly direct, uh, you can uh, write directly in the chat um, and I'll just, uh, yeah. So if you can write directly in the chat uh, about your main domain of work, it will help me to maybe tell you some examples and, and all of that. So we see finance, um, AI, communications, real estate, marketing, machine learning, super interesting. Great. Digital marketing, insurance. Perfect. So a lot of people familiar already with the machine learning frameworks and all of that. And BI also. Great, great, great. And uh, uh, second question and last question, I'm asking a lot of you now. Um, so do you already know what recommender systems are? And if yes, do you know any machine learning models uh, for the task? So for example, it could be, uh, yes, you already know about it and you know about the model uh, collaborative for the moment. I'll look at the chat again. So ALS, interesting, no, perfect. Perfect, so I'll try to introduce the recommendation properly. Great, so people uh, more or less familiar with that. Perfect, item-based, RNN, great. Perfect. For, so thanks a lot for your participation. It helps me uh, tailoring the presentation to, uh, to you. Um, so starting off with the context. So uh, let's start off by defining what is a uh, recommendation. So what are recommendation? So as you all know, uh, we have more and more places that we can go. Uh, we have so many uh, options towards like uh, what kind of items we can buy, what kind of restaurants we can go eat to, uh, what kind of movies we can watch. And so recommendations and uh, recommender system it can be seen as a tool for helping user uh, finding relevant information among all the options that are available to us. So among all the catalog of options, the recommender system will, will pinpoint some, some options that could be relevant for a user. Um, and I think you've all seen a couple of uh, examples of, of that uh, recommendation. So um, as I mentioned there, so Amazon, Netflix, they really popularized the, the recommender systems. It gathered a lot of attention in the past years. We saw that uh, it was useful, it was helpful for the user, and it also stimulates the sales and the product usage. And concretely, the task is to recommend items of users to, uh, to all of the rest. Uh, to, yeah, I uh, recommend items of interest to uh, all users. Uh, so I, I put two examples there. So first off, Netflix. So uh, for me, let's say uh, topics of Netflix. So Netflix thinks that those movies uh, would be of interest uh, for me. So for all of the user of Netflix, they have some, some movies of interest that they deem as uh, 
interesting for me. So the party, the gentleman, all of that. And another example with uh, Amazon. So I think this would be for someone named Thomas. So um, based on pr probably his previous uh, purchases and what other people like him bought, uh, those are uh, recommendations that would be for him. So among all the catalog of, of items that Thomas could buy, the recommender system considered that those items would be uh, interesting for Thomas. And in the case of Decathlon, uh, of Decathlon it would be um, so multiple places where we can do a recommendation. One of the places on, is on the website. So this is not the actual website, but it's just a bit of a reconstruction. But um, when you go on a website, and if you're connected, if you remember, and you have a previous um, history of, of purchases and of clicks, you will see uh, some items that can be recommended to you. So in this case, uh, it would be someone that is interested into uh, weightlifting. Uh, that is that is not my case, unfortunately. But um, so it would be items that are that are considered as interesting by the recommender system. Uh, so you see dumbbells, you see you see bars, and you see a bench there. So among all the catalog of, of thousands thousands of products, these items were recommended, personalized, directly for the member that was connected on this website. So home page is one place, and then we have another place. So in uh, post purchase emails, so um, when someone does a, a purchase, uh, there's an email that that is sent to that person, and in that email you can uh, add some products. So you can add, uh, let's say, um, products that that are interesting. So th those are some suggestions that come from the recommender system also. So you can add some uh, equipment for running, uh, socks and all of that. So there's a couple of places where you can do recommendation, but th the idea is the same: always to recommend items of interest to uh, the users. Um, and, and when we look at it from a machine learning angle, basically you have some data um, that you want to wanna use in a machine learning model uh, to feed some recommendations that are tailored for all the uh, users that you have in your, uh, in your, on your platform. So let's first look at the, the data that can be used. Um, so the uh, available data, so quick note here, so the recommendations are only served to uh, the members. And so the precautions we're taking to protect the privacy of customers, um, the, the confidentiality and all of that, um, and, and uh, uh, all the required uh, yeah, precautions we're taking by the government and by this uh, research group. So you, you usually have um, three kinds of uh, data sets. Uh, on e-commerce platform, and this was the case with Decathlon. So the first um, available data, data set would be the user item interaction. So what happens is that when you uh, are a member and you uh, click or you purchase an item, you will have your uh, transaction or your click that is recording inside of the database with your uh, ID and with the item ID. So if you bought, let's say, a, a hockey stick and the, ho ID, my ID, the item ID of the hockey stick is this one, well, you bought the hockey stick, so you would have this line that uh, represent the interaction between you that purchased the hockey stick. And this is online and in store if the, the customer is a member and, and swipes um, their card uh, at the cash desk. So interaction data, user item interaction data. And then you have some features. So you have features about the users. Um, so when you uh, register as a member, you can declare if you are a male or a female, and if you, you can declare, or you can choose not to declare it, or you can choose, um, so you can choose yeah, not to uh, fill up this, uh, this form, and you can also declare what are your favorite sports. And quick also disclaimer here is that Decathlon wishes to uh, phase out the usage of gender for equity purposes. So this was used now, but it, in, in further uh, research, it might not be used. So you have your user features, but you also have your item features. So um, in the uh, Decathlon catalog, there's all the item um, with their item ID. And then you have information about what kind of uh, characteristics are available. So is it more for, uh, more for male, more for female, for junior? What's the name of the item, uh, family, department, and all of that. And you have the linked sports. So these are uh, like typical examples of data that would be available for a, a recommender system for uh, e-commerce platforms. So interaction data um, and, and user and feature uh, user features and uh, item features. Um, so using that, uh, all of that data, uh, so Decathlon and, and multiple uh, e-commerce uh, platforms started out um, with some more, more simple recommendation models and moved on to more complex recommendation models. So uh, just a couple of examples here. Um, so one of the first uh, model that was put on was the most popular products model. So the, the, the simple idea would be that the time item, the 10 items that were the most popular in the last week would be uh, recommended to all uh, the users. So you just look at the, the last week and see what items were the most bought or clicked on and you recommend the same to all of them. So this is not personalized, but it's still a recommendation. And then uh, matrix factorization was also used um, using the user item interaction that I, that I show, uh, 
uh, database that I show you and that I showed you. It was tried by Decathlon and uh, currently more used um, are the recurrent neural networks. So I won't give much details about those. There's an appendix for that if you have any questions. But the idea here was to uh, present that uh, multiple models were already tried. They were experiment. They had already experimented with the recommendation. Um, so they were ready for more thing, something a bit more uh, complex, a bit uh, a bit more advanced. And um, the idea was that the models that are presented here, so the, those three models, um, the intuition behind it is that some information that was available in databases um, was not uh, not all the information available in databases was used was taken into account by those models. So there was some information that was left on the table, and the goal was to try to, to, to optimize all the information that was available to, to um, feed the most relevant recommendations. So there come there came uh, the graph neural networks. Um, so I'll start off by defining what it is a, what is a graph. So a graph can be uh, defined as a set of nodes, or it can be called vertices also. Uh, vertices, or, or, yeah, anyway, vertices, um, and uh, edges. And it can also be called links and that connect the nodes uh, one to another. So uh, like dummy example at the, at the top right would be all the nodes here in gray and you have edges between the nodes that are uh, connected. And then I put two other examples. So the first example is a molecule, uh, which is a graph. Um, so the molecule can be seen as a graph. Um, I think this is a gluc glucose uh, molecule. I'm not a chemist, but uh, this I think this is it. And then you have, so the nodes would be here uh, the atoms, uh, atoms, and then you would have some bonds between uh, the nodes that are the uh, that are the links. So this is one example, a typical example of graphs. And then another typical example that uh, most of you might be familiar with is the the social network. So let's say Facebook or or Twitter. Uh, you would have all the persons in the in the network, and there would be a link between two person if the two persons are let's say friends uh, on Facebook. So there are multiple ty uh, types of graphs around us. A lot of information can be seen as graph information, um, and, and some of the major examples include those two, uh, those two examples, so social network and, and molecule. Um, so with this graph, we could move on to, to graph neural networks. Uh, and the intuition between uh, why graph neural networks are interesting is that the data might be better represented in a graph. So sometimes data include complex relationships, uh, sources of, of information that are really diverse, uh, there's a lot, lot of, uh, of information. There's a lot of different links between the information. And um, the data might be represented, like better represented in a graph than in a table or in uh, any other format that would be used by typical machine learning algorithms. And what this allows is it allows to leverage both the content information and the graph structure. So the models that I presented you earlier on would only uh, either leverage the graph structure, so only leverage the user item interaction, or the content information. So they would either use the, the interaction or the features. But there's not many models that, that can use both. And one of the promises of uh, GNNs are to leverage both kind of information. Um, and, and that being said, like they, they would uh, leverage all the information that is available to feed the, the most relevant recommendations. And I, I, put a, I put on a couple of examples here in the past uh, five or six years um, that, were, uh, that were used by some uh, major companies. So Pinterest uh, was one of the first to popularize this. Um, there was a blog post and a scientific paper. More recently, Uber Eats has been experimenting a lot with, uh, with uh, graph neural networks for recommendations. And uh, there was a blog post also recently by Google Maps with their uh, DeepMind um, uh, company uh, that used graph neural networks to predict uh, traffic. So there's a lot of um, a lot of interest from the research community and the industrial community in, in GNNs, uh, and they are usually they are often used for recommendation purposes, but they are used for a lot of purposes also. Um, and so, quick history, a quick history of GNNs. So they were first proposed in the late '90s and early uh, 2000s, um, and there are multiple types of GNNs and only one of them are interesting to us for, for this talk, but a lot of them can be used for a lot of different tasks. Um, and yeah, quick note here is that nomenclature is still not, there's still no big consensus about uh, the nomenclature that should be used. So I'm using one here, but some other uh, researchers might use different ones. Uh, so the first ones were recurrent GNNs, and then we moved on to convolutional GNNs, or com GNNs, and then there were some spectral base. And now the ones that are interesting for us um, are uh, the special based. Uh, spatial based convolutional GNNs. So I'll refer to them to GNNs uh, 
from now on. Um, so I'll try to walk you through uh, how the uh, recommendation works uh, using GNX. So it can be seen as an encoder-decoder arch uh, architecture, um, or we can call it representational learning. So it's a uh, two-step uh, to learn uh, to, to, to do uh, recommendation using GNX. So the first step is to encode. So the first step is to generate high-quality embeddings for all the nodes in the graph. So you use the content information that you add, you use the, the, the features, you use the uh, interaction, and you generate embeddings for all the users and all the items. So this is all the left part of the, the bottom graph. And then using those embeddings, uh, you will predict preferences between uh, users and items. So you will predict a preference score between a user and an item using the embedding, and you will recommend the items that have the, the highest preference score. Uh, so we will first look at uh, the first step, which is generating a high quality embedding. So this is what is uh, unique about GNNs, and this is where uh, the most interesting uh, innovations of GNNs uh, appear. So the first part, the goal is to generate high quality embeddings for all the nodes in the graph. And this is based on uh, what is called neural message passing or information propagation. And a quick note here about embeddings. Uh, so embeddings can be uh, defined as some low dimensional learned continuous vector representations of uh, the entities. Um, so in our case, user and items. So just a quick example here would be that if you have a user that uh, declared that he, they are interested in a sport and that they bought item X and item Y and they clicked on item Z. So all this information that we have about the user that is in the graph, we will try to, um, to represent all that information in one single vector that is low dimensional with uh, with some uh, values uh, in that vector. So you represent all the information that you have in with one embedding. And the goal is to have embeddings for all the nodes that we have uh, in the graph. So I will first off um, present how this uh, embedding generation works uh, visually. Um, so bear with me. It was uh, it's a it, it, it's a I would say five or six step process. Uh, and you, the first thing you need to have is the graph. So the first thing you do, if you wanna generate embeddings for all the nodes of the graph is to create uh, the graph. So you create the graph using the user item interaction that we uh, talked about earlier on. So um, you have the customers and the items and you have uh, if they clicked or if they purchased uh, the items. So using that data set, you will build this following graph. So on the left, you have the users and on the right, you have the items. So in, in real life, it would be a much, much bigger graph. This is a, a smaller graph here. And so um, all the uh, items that this user clicked or purchased are linked. Uh, you have a link between the user and the items that he or she clicked on or purchased. So let's say this uh, customer here purchased this item here. So you would have a purchase link between the user and the item. So you build all your graph using that uh, user and uh, user item interaction data. When you have your graph built, you can uh, attribute features to all the nodes in the graph. So I, I showed you earlier on the user features and the item features. So uh, you will use the, these uh, features to attribute uh, features to the um, to the nodes in the graph. So for all the nodes, you have here the, the feature a vector here. So let's say this this uh, customer here. Uh, you have this uh, feature vector here, and same thing for the items. So let's say the item here, you know that it's all zeros. So you attribute this feature to the item. And here, so here is all zeros, but uh, obviously, so there could be uh, different kind of uh, vectors for all the for all the items. So the first, the, after you have a graph, you want to attribute uh, features to all the nodes, and the feature will be considered as uh, messages. So those are all messages uh, for all the nodes. So all each node has a message that is uh, that contains all the features that we have about this node. And so the goal will be to propagate those messages uh, between one node uh, to another. So interesting um, innovation about the graph neural networks is that all the edges uh, will have a neural network that is um, associated with the edge. So for the purchase edge, you would have this blue uh, square here. So this is this would be one type of uh, one neural network, and then you would have uh, a green square, for example, here that would be another type of neural network. So all edges have a neural network associated with. And if we zoom on, let's say this user here, what will happen is that this user will pull information from all of uh, from all of its neighbors. 
So you see here that this user um, purchased this item and this user clicked on this item. So the user is pulling the information from these two neighbors. The information go through the neural network uh, and then uh, you use this information that went through the neural network. So uh, another time, so the uh, user pulls the information, information goes through the neural network and then the user can, the node can use um, this information to uh, update his message. So when you have all the information of your neighbors, so in this case, the, this blue and this, this green envelope, so that represent the information of their neighbors, you can update your initial information um, using a function that takes your original message and an aggregation of all your neighborhood messages. So in this case, you, you would have uh, two messages here that you aggregate, so it could be a sum, um, and then you do a, uh, you do a function that takes into account your original message and a representation of all your uh, neighborhood. And this gives uh, the updated representation of, uh, of this user. And when you have the updated representation of all your users, you can repeat the process. So this was one layer of a GNN, and then you can repeat this process as many times as you wish. You can repeat it two, three, four, five times. And, uh, uh, the more you repeat it, the the, the further will uh, the further your uh, circle of, of of consideration will grow. So if you repeat it two times, then you will have the information from your neighbors here, but you will also have information from the neighbors of your neighbors. So you would have the information of this one that is incorporated inside your uh, your embedding. So you update the message and then you update it as many times as you wish, and uh, your final embedding is the 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 final message after. Uh, the many times that you repeated this process. So this was uh, visually, uh, we can look at it uh, mathematically. So um, I don't wanna uh, spend too much time on the equation here, but uh, this is um, the equation that represents the uh, message of node U at layer K. So uh, it could be at the first layer or the second layer. So basically the, um, the message uh, at layer K of node U is an activation function of your original message, so the original message of node u plus, uh, in our case it was plus, but yeah, so, so you, you take this one and you also take the um, information that you have from your neighborhood. So all the nodes that are in the neighborhood of u, you, uh, in this case, you would take a, a sum of all those nodes and uh, you can add them up. And then um, this would be your representation of uh, the node u as your kit. So the, where the, the neural network happens are the W here. So the Ws are the trainable parameter matrices. Uh, so this is what you train on when you train the GNN. So you would have your uh, representation um, be multiplied by this trainable parameter uh, matrix. So this is how you would uh, do like the neural network part of it. And then uh, the final embedding. So the, the Z in this case, so the, the final embedding of your node would be the uh, embedding at the last layer. Uh, of GNNs. So the goal is to have uh, the Z, so the, the final embedding for all the nodes in the graph. So this was uh, how to generate uh, embeddings for all the nodes in the graph. We can now move on to uh, what to do with those embeddings. So once you have all the embeddings of your nodes in the graph, you can use them to predict preferences between uh, users and items. So how it works is that um, the task here is to predict the score for a pair of user and item. So um, let's say you have this, uh, this uh, last user here that interacted already with the, the, the bottom item. Um, you will predict the score for the pair of this user and all the items that uh, they did not interact with. And then you would recommend the items that have the highest scores. So the scoring function here would be if you want to have the similarity between a user U and item V, you would have a, a similarity function between the embedding of the user U and the embedding of the item V. Um, so you do that for all the, the items that the, uh, that the user uh, did not interact with. And um, the similarity will be your, uh, your final score. And then you recommend the items that are the, the most similar. And in our case, uh, what we did was the cosine similarity. So you, the, the F here would be a simple cosine similarity between the embedding of the user and the embedding of the, of the item. So quick summary. So you generate embeddings uh, with the whole uh, message passing process that, that we looked at. So you create the graph, attribute nodes, uh, pass the messages, and you do it as many times as you wish. 
And then using the embeddings, you can compute the uh, similarity score. So uh, you compute the similarity score with all the items that the user did not interact with, and then you recommend the items that have the highest scores. Um, so this was the, the whole uh, GenN model, and we can look at how to train a model. So what we are training on actually are the, 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 the parameters here, so the W here. So you have a W that is uh, um, for a specific edge type. So you would uh, so you would have to train all the the, the learnable uh, parameter uh, matrices um, in your in your model. So if you have let's say four layers, well you would have four layers of um, of uh, matrices to train on. So this can lead on to a lot of uh, a lot of parameters to train for. And you uh, and you uh, optimize the model using a max margin. So we there's multiple uh, loss function that could be used, but the for my, Sorry, the last function that is used now is the max margin uh, loss function, and we uh, use it with negative sampling. So uh, in a nutshell, is the, the model has to predict the higher score for a positive edge than for a random negative edge. And I, I put the equation in appendix again, but uh, this is how the model uh, learns the correct uh, weights here that are in these uh, matrices. That was the basic um, GNN uh, model for recommendation. And with this research, we we pushed on two uh, two main uh, two main aspects of uh, of the GNNs. So the first aspect is the uh, graph creation. So in the literature, it is said that uh, the state of the art work uh, state of the art works on GNNs are mainly for uh, homogeneous graphs. So so for more simple graphs with less uh, edge types and less uh, nodes uh, node types. So what we did is we we pushed on that. Uh, that aspect, and we added sports uh, as nodes in the graph, and all the uh, related edges from the sports nodes to the items and to the user nodes. So this was more diverse, and, and it represented a richer source uh, of information that the model can learn from to predict the uh, the uh, embeddings to to generate the embeddings for the user and the items. So here we can say that uh, we can see that the sports were added as nodes. So this is again a simplification, but you have the the, the sports here. And there would be a link, so an edge between a user if this user declared the sport as favorite. And then same thing, if the item is, is uh, considered as related to the sport by Decathlon, there would be a, a link between those two. And what happens is that during uh, the message passing, so when all the messages get passed in the graph, you get information from the sports also. So you can uh, have a richer source of information to, uh, to learn from. You, in that way, you incorporate um, much of the available information uh, and, and you, you uh, make available uh, some new information that the model can learn from. So this was the first uh, contribution of that. So we, we, uh, we added this, the sports as node and this uh, helped enhance a lot of the, the performance of the model. The second uh, contribution is uh, regarding seasonality. So the seasonality is a common uh, trade in, uh, a lot of e-commerce, well, multiple e-commerce platforms. So the idea is that um, when it's, let's say, summer, people are buying beach tennis rackets, let's say, but, but the, those people are not buying snow gloves. So um, the products are really seasonal. So uh, when it's the winter, you usually buy winter products. And when it's the summer, you usually buy summer products. Uh, and it's interesting to, um, to understand uh, what products are trending in this particular season because those are the uh, products that should be recommended and not the uh, other types of uh, products. Um, and so this kind of uh, seasonality accounts for a lot of the variations in the patterns of uh, interest of customers. So I, it's it, it could be relevant uh, to know, uh, let's say that I'm interested in surf, but it's not relevant for the recommender system to recommend me a surfboard right now because I, I will not buy it because it's not a, a timed uh, recommendation. So it's it is it might be accurate to represent my preferences, but it also has to be uh, uh, served in a timely manner. So it has to be served at the right moment in the right season. So this was the idea behind uh, what we implemented. So we what we implemented was uh, really simple. So instead of uh, parameterizing the model on all the edges of the graph, uh, we only uh, train a model on a subsample of the most recent edges. So that way, what, what that does is that the model is parameterized to give greater scores to uh, the user item pairs that were seen recently. So uh, since, they, since the user item pairs were seen recently, we can assume that those items are popular in this season. 
So just this simple, uh, this simple uh, adjustment allowed us to uh, have some recommendation that we're in the right season. And uh, we did a couple of other things regarding seasonality, but this is the one that that made uh, the most difference, the, the, the biggest difference. Mm, so uh, using those two uh, enhancements, we had some interesting results. So the, the evaluation was done uh, in an offline manner. So we have offline metrics. So unfortunately, there was no infrastructure uh, available for online evaluation. So uh, uh, when, when I say online evaluation, it means that usually you would compare the recommender system uh, with, a, with a, a subset of your user, and then you would use another re recommendation uh, recommender system with another subset, and then you would compare the performance of those two recommendations uh, online, like directly on the website. But in our case, we did it uh, offline, so with some uh, temporal data. So we trained the model on 50 weeks, and then we reported the metrics on the most recent uh, two weeks. So there were three metrics that were chosen uh, by Decathlon, and all these metrics are for uh, recommendations of 10 items. So uh, basically, the precision and the recall, they measure uh, how accurate the recommendations were. And the coverage um, measures the proportion of products that were recommended at least once. So this, this is more a business uh, metric that is interesting. Um, if you're, let's say, Decathlon, you might want to make sure that a vast number of products are recommended so that not always the same products are recommended. Uh, you want to give uh, some space to multiple of your uh, products in your catalog. So quick uh, example of what would be the recall. So the recall is the proportion of products that were actually bought, which uh, were recommended. So let's say um, you have two users. So this first user gets recommended some gloves, some ski poles, a backpack, and a brush. Uh, and then in the last two weeks, what they actually uh, bought or clicked on would be this, uh, this item here and the, a backpack and some gloves. So you see here you have two correct recommendations. And here this uh, person got recommended those four items, but the, the, the ground truth was totally different. So those are two wrong recommendations. So you see that those two are correct and those three are uh, not correct. So in that case, you would have a recall of two out of five. Uh, so this would be uh, 40%. And so this was an example in 40% um, actually is a, would be a super, super, super great recall because the task can be the task is considered as very difficult for the model because there are thousands and thousands of items that can be recommended. So it's hard for the model to to pinpoint which uh, of the nine thousand items uh, would be interesting uh, for a specific user. Maybe uh, the model will re recommend the right let's say item family, but it has to recommend the right item uh, for uh, to have a, um, a positive result on the recall uh, on the recall metric. So the results were uh, were interesting. They they surpassed the uh, established goal. So the baseline model was around six percent. This was the most popular products model, and then uh, the goal of Decathlon to move further with this uh, with this um, with this model was to have at least nine percent of recall, and the model achieved twelve point twelve point five percent. So this was some uh, interesting uh, metrics. Uh, still, so the. the the goal was to beat the baseline model by a certain margin in order to move on to uh, online evaluation and to do A-B testing with uh, other models. So the model uh, had great results on offline. And now the next step will be to, to test it in an online setting and do some A-B testing with the current models that are in place. And I put on, uh, I think, two examples of recommendation here that I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll go by really quickly. Uh, so if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. But um, so the first example would be someone that bought uh, I think that they, that this user clicked on trousers, uh, jackets, bikes, and then uh, got recommended some jackets, some trousers, um, and then some items related to ski. Uh, but the ground truth was uh, related to trousers and to uh, helmet. So interesting recommendation here. Um, so the user might be interested in mountain bikes and in biking in general, and the recommendation was towards skis. Uh, but it, it's the winter currently, so maybe this was seen by the model as a, like a seasonal alternative to um, to biking. Um, so it can be seen as an interesting uh, recommendation here, and the model was uh, uh, almost accurate with the with the trousers. Second example, uh, also to show that uh, you do not need to have a big 
uh, history of, of interaction to have some relevant recommendation. So this user uh, bought a cross trainer, which is this uh, elliptic uh, fitness uh, machine, and then got recommended some, some dumbbells, some elastic bands, and a lot of things regarding fitness. And the, the ground truth was uh, regarding el elastic bands. So this model was uh, almost accurate again. So this, this was just to give you a, uh, an idea of what kind of recommendation are, are fed to users based on their previous, um, their previous uh, interactions. So I wanted to leave you with a couple of takeaways. So uh, first off, just a little summary of what was, uh, what was said. So we explored the, the GNNs for e-commerce uh, recommendations. Um, so it was in two steps. So the first step, the embedding generation with the message passing. And then the next step would be the, the second step would be the scoring function. So using the embeddings to uh, predict which items are the most similar to, uh, to the user of interest. Uh, and then we added uh, two functionalities, two main functionalities. So for seasonality and, and a more complex graph. So this uh, gave richer information to learn from using the sports and the new edges and the training on recent edges for uh, seasonality. The results are uh, encouraging and the uh, uh, methodology of GNNs is, is, is promising. Um, but I wanted to, so, so two takeaways from that. So the one is, um, is regarding the, 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 the idea of should a company implement or not GNNs. So in my opinion, this is not a low hanging fruit. Um, GNNs uh, might be interesting for teams that are more experimented. Uh, maybe in research and development, it's still pretty experimental. Uh, there are limited numbers of impl implementation papers and, and uh, uh, libraries and example. Like if you want to do a computer vision or natural language processing, there are so many examples that you can follow and, and you can use pre-trained model and all of that. So this is a bit more limited for uh, GNNs. And as such, it, it is maybe um, uh, more for teams that are a bit more uh, experimental. Uh, but they are uh, really interesting for a couple of, of reasons. So I, I said it that way, so changing the data paradigm has some major advantages. So the typical uh, machine learning models would, would use um, tabular data. And this, uh, so you would change that from, uh, you would change the, the way you see data from tabular to graph data. And uh, graph data allows, is a uh, really more flexible framework. So it allows us to have, um, to integrate much more information into the into the machine learning task uh, and there's a lot of graph data around us that uh, were kind of changed in a way to to fit them into more typical uh, machine learning models but we can uh, exploit these graph data directly in a graph and in that way you can uh, leverage uh, way more the information that is available and it when you have let's say e-commerce platform it's super easy to add new data sources add new nodes add new edges add new features uh, so it's it's really interesting to have a very uh, diverse source of information to learn from. And I put a couple of examples here uh, for Decathlon. So uh, Decathlon could add some uh, features of images, some uh, social connections between the users, some categories of items. So there's a world of possibilities that could be added inside of Graph that might lead to uh, a richer source of in uh, information to learn from and as such better uh, recommendations. And the second point is, uh, in the main, uh, in the same line of thought, but is that you can have also multiple tasks uh, done uh, by the graph neural networks. So in our case, we were recommending items, but when you put uh, more types of nodes in the graph, you can change your task also. So maybe you wanted to recommend items, but you can also recommend, let's say, sports activities directly. Um, so if you have sports in your graph and you have activities linked to those sports, well, you can use the embeddings of all the nodes in the graph to do some other task like some uh, sports activities recommendation and another example maybe for more a marketplace uh, marketplace uh, case would be let's say you uh you in the example of uber, uber eats you can recommend both the shops and the products so you could recommend both the uh, restaurants and the dishes. So when you have all the available information inside one graph it is easier uh, after that to to kind of choose what you want to recommend inside of the graph and choose the tasks that are available because all the information is in the graph and then you can just pinpoint uh, what kind of task you want to do with the with the information. And um, so just uh, as a, a final note, so these are a couple of resources that are uh, that might be interesting. I personally use the deep graph library 
which can be used uh, with PyTorch or with TensorFlow. So this is really interesting. And we did uh, publish the code for uh, for the for this research. So here is the link for the code. It's not obviously not the whole code. Uh, all uh, confidential data was put out of this code, but it should give you a, a, a great uh, overview of how to uh, implement GNN. And the idea between putting it public was to help other businesses to to uh, experiment with GNN. So don't hesitate. And I also put a little link here of interesting papers about uh, GNNs. Thank you. So I'll be taking uh, questions. Thank uh, you, Jerry. Yeah, you're welcome. It was very, very interesting. Great. So we, have a question in the, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. The first is uh, William. William, do, do you want to, um, to ask your question directly? I can just uh, read it, or William, if you're, if you're still there, you, you can say it out loud, but uh, I think I understand it. So the question was, um, in the forward past, have you tried averaging the messages of neighboring nodes instead of a sum? Um, before the matrix multiplication. So this was the first question. So um, if you remember, so I, I can maybe go back uh, to that. But uh, so when you uh, average, when you aggregate the, the messages of the nodes, um, we did it with a sum, but there's uh, many other things that could be done. So uh, the, the answer is yes, William. So we tried, so this was like kind of a third contribution uh, of this research. So we tried a lot of different fr frameworks. So we tried some, we tried um, uh, max pooling also, we tried minimum pooling, and we tried uh, average pooling. And the kind of the conclusion of that was that um, it did not make such a difference on the, uh, on the embeddings. And in the end, there was some pretty similar results between all those, the, those technologies. And in the end, I think the sum was what gave the greatest, uh, the greatest result, but it was like around 1% uh, of difference between those uh, frameworks. And one of the things that were that, that was said in the, the paper that was submitted is that depending on the data, um, all the kinds of ways to aggregate should be tried because one might be better than the other. And so the second question, I can read it again maybe, oh. but. Oh. It's from Alexandre Ash. Uh, how are you dealing with the seasonality do you label it manually in the data or is it inferred? Yeah, so uh, so it is not manually labeled. Uh, so as I said, um, so the idea is that we have, uh, so we have the timestamp for all the interaction uh, interactions. So if you clicked on, uh, if you clicked on something uh, like 12 of December, we will have the timestamp for that. So we use this timestamp to choose which are the most recent uh, edges. And then we will only uh, only train on the most recent edges. So it's not done manually. Uh, when the the interaction is recorded, um, we know which season it is in, and so we will take the most recent edges to uh, to train on. I don't know if you're still here, Alexan, but if you have any follow up questions, you can uh, ask them. Okay. The third question is from Ernesta Follon. Uh, which framework do you use? Um, so I, I mentioned it at the very end. Um, so uh, I'm using a deep graph library and uh, this allows the usage of uh, both PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow. So basically the, the library is built on top of one of these. So personally I was using Python and I was using PyTorch and uh, deep graph library. But the interesting thing about the graph library is that, uh, is that you could use also TensorFlow if you prefer TensorFlow. And if you prefer serving your recommendation TensorFlow, you can do it that way. You have a question from Justin. Have you tried promoting discount or in-house products with a better margin? Yeah, uh, super interesting question. So this is more on the um, recommender system side. And uh, we were working more on the model side. So usually, well, not usually, but uh, in, in many cases, um, so you can have the model that, that gives, let's say the preference score. So we have your final score for 
uh, 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 let's say item um, a user a given user in a given item and then you can work on the system side of the model so you have the score but then you can work on the system side and then you can say okay i want that in my 10 items i want at least one that uh, is in-house in the case of the get all products are, are private labels all products are uh, labels of the get um or you could say that you simply multiply the the score by let's say the profit margin that you have on the, the items so this is more a, a business uh, business uh, concern and um, the catalon shows uh, add some some like some preferences for that but there was no clear direction of like we want to promote uh, discounts or we want to promote uh, better margin products but it could be done but more on the system side Okay, the last question in the chat is from Sofia Dan. For the accuracy of your recommendation, is it a strict match between recommended uh, items and clicked purchase items? Or do you consider that if you recommend blue gloves and the user bought black gloves, uh, it is still a, a partial match? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, interesting question also. So, this uh, pr the scope of this project was not uh, so much to work on the, the metrics that were used, but uh, so to answer directly your question, if I recommend blue gloves and the user bought black gloves, it's considered as a as an error. So, it's considered as a not a correct recommendation. But uh, one of the next steps of this uh, of this research uh, project could be to have this kind of more subtle uh, recall. So if you have, let's say, a product in the same family or in the same uh, sport or in the same universe, it could be a partial uh, success. So um, so for now on, it's it's not a it's it's not a successful recommendation if you have a partial match. But it could be done in the, the further uh, in the next steps of the of this project. Oh, you have a question from Alexis Silvestre. Is there plans to use your model on online pur purpose at Decathlon in the future? Yeah, uh, great question, Alexis. Uh, so <laughs> the um, this model. Uh, so I, when I mentioned in the metrics, the next step is to compare the models. Um, is to compare more directly the current model with this GNN model. So um, depending on the, prior, uh, on the priorities of Decathlon, uh, they will at one point compare the two models. And if the uh, two models, uh, if the GNN model uh, beats the uh, current model in place by a certain margin, it will be uh, put online. But for now, it was, it was more a proof of concept of this model. And the next step will be uh, towards comparing really this model with the previous ones. And I think there was another question by William that, that we missed uh, at first. Um, yeah, I thought as well, because I had to fix my mic, so I'm not sure if, uh, if you answered it or not. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah, I, can... Well, I, yeah, I can just tell it uh, about yeah. basically, um, you talked about adding like sports nodes into the graph or like, in, I, I would say like any types of features. So what's the difference between using like as nodes or just directly using the feature as your like uh, in your item messages? Mm -hmm. Uh, so good question. So this is uh, like one of the, the, the most promising things about GNN. So when the, the sports are used as nodes, uh, you can link them to both the users and to the items. So um, you can pass the information from uh, one item to a user through the, uh, through the, um, through the sport. So let's say you bought, um, or maybe another example would, uh, would say, let's say you're interested in two skis, but that you never bought skis, but you said that you're interested in skiing. Well, then you would receive some information from all the products that are uh, related to ski, and this would be put inside your embedding. So then you would receive information from the skiing uh, node, uh, even though you never bought anything about, uh, about skis. So um, it's, it's more flexible in the way, and then the neural networks can choose to give much uh, uh, more uh, weight to one or the other feature, but adding them as, as nodes give uh, like a greater range of possibilities uh, when pulling information from the neighbors. Okay, thanks for the answer. Uh, I got another one about cold start items and users. I was wondering, like, yeah, let's say you have a user that have like almost no edges, does it get like does it gets like almost like random recommendations or something like that? 
Yeah, uh, so great question also. So um, again, it was a uh, like tackling the cold start problem was a bit out of scope of the out of scope of this project. Um, but uh, so you only need one like basically you only need one edge to have information from the whole graph, and you also have information from your user features. So the user features are are very limited. But uh, if, if you have let's say just one uh, interaction. Then you will pull information from this interaction, and as I uh, shown in the as I showed in the the results, so the example number two had only one interaction, and then they add some uh, relevant recommendations uh, with only one interaction. So, like the cold start problem, where you, where you never interacted with the model, is harder to tackle. But in this case, if you have only one interaction, uh, the recommendations are still pretty relevant. Okay, get right. Yeah, I think this is the advantage of this kind of method versus like just co-occurrence or some ALS. Here we can actually use the power of like the, the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors to get yeah. more interactions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also you had some really impressive like increase in like uh, metrics for your model. I was wondering, was your baseline the RNN that you were talking earlier or something else? No, so uh, maybe this was not as clear as, uh, as it should have been, but the baseline model is the most popular products. Uh, and then, so uh, so the goal of like how the how the, the the research was structured is that if the model beat the baseline model by a certain margin, so in that case, if the GNN model reached nine percent, then we would move on to compare it with uh, the current models that are in place. So um, the baseline model here is is the most popular products. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you have a question from Guillaume. What's the time spent for model training? Uh, great question, Guillaume. Um, so uh, the, the cool thing about the, the GNN is that you can train the model on a subsample of your graph, well, on a subsample of, yeah, of your graph. And then uh, all you need to train are the Ws, are the parameters and matrices. Um, so uh, when you uh, when you train a model, you can choose to train it on a subsample, and then it will generalize to unseen data, unseen nodes. Um, so actually, uh, during training, I think um, the hyperparameterization was around one hour per iterate, uh, per uh, iteration. But so you would have like a probably like tens of iterations. So to choose the right hyperparameters, it's uh, approximately one day of training. And then when you have the right hyperparameters, you will probably choose a, a bit bigger uh, sample size, but it's around, let's say from one to, uh, to five or six hours of training on a GPU. Um, and then you can, you can uh, check if it genera generalizes well to uh, other nodes. And if it doesn't, maybe you take a bigger uh, sample size and, and so on. And maybe I can answer the task of uh, the question of Jan at the same time was, uh, how long does the training of the model takes and how does it scale with the amount of data? So um, we train on uh, approximately 30% of the graph and it scaled really well. So the performances were, were similar. So uh, I would say that around 30% seems to give great uh, results in the case of the Catalan, but it, it, it probably will uh, differ from one case to the other. I know that in the case of Pinterest, they were training on uh, approximately 20%, I think, of the nodes. Uh, so it, it, it really depends on the, on the task, but I would say in that range. Does anyone else have uh, any question? Uh, I think the slides won't be available, but the presentation will. But uh, if you want to write to me directly, uh, on LinkedIn or something like that, I can uh, I can share that with you. I will just double check if it's okay to uh, to share the slides, and then I will uh, I will talk maybe with Fatu if we can share the slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll give you the the email, uh, Ernest, if you want. I can send you an email. Perfect. So well, thank you, Jeremy. It was a very, very great presentation. So the recording will be sent to you at the beginning of next week if you miss uh, any part. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. Yeah, thanks a lot to everyone that was there. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Great presentation. Merci, merci, merci.
you. <laughs> Euh, Jérémy, est-ce que, est que DGL, tu avais un... Est-ce que tu as deux secondes, en fait? Je, euh, ouais. dire... je vais peut-être ouais, juste euh, demander à Fatou, euh, j'arrête l'enregistrement, oui. peut-être? Oui, tu peux arrêter. Ah. Merci.